Okay, hello everyone. Thank you, thank you again for joining and welcome to today's webinar session on analyzing One Lambda's all type NGS assay using TypeStream Visual Software version 1.2. My name is Baron Victor and I'm the product manager for next generation sequencing products here at One Lambda. Today, I'm happy to introduce you to our very own Keith Kurtz. Keith earned his Bachelor of Science degree in 2007 from the University of Wisconsin and began his career in HLA shortly thereafter in 2008. Since 2008, Keith has supported both Sanger and Next Generation Sequencing Technologies as a subject matter expert in various customer facing and support roles. First, as a field application specialist, and for the past six years in various leadership roles as a global technical support manager, and currently as manager of our global field application scientist team at One Lambda. Today, Keith will be talking to us about the practical applications of analyzing One Lambda's all type NGS assay using TypeStream Visual Software. It is now my distinct pleasure to turn today's program over, our, over to our presenter, Keith Kurtz. Thanks a lot, Baron. Um, and, and welcome everyone as well to, uh, to today's webinar. So Baron's already had the chance to introduce to you the, the topic and the title of, of today's webinar. So let me just jump straight forward here uh, to our agenda for the day. So I, I've split this presentation up into two main parts or two main sections. So this first section, uh, really serves to introduce everyone on a call to our TypeStream Visual NGS analysis software. And as the sub bullet subtitle uh, mentions here, we want to highlight the design of the software, uh, the various interfaces available within the software to, the, uh, to you as the user, and then also highlight from a mid to high level some of the features uh, that are available as well. The second part of the presentation then um, will allow us to dive into this uh, topic in a little bit more detail. And the goal of the second part is to be able to um, offer you um, some uh, a view at how we can use this software, the various interfaces, the various features, um, to analyze your data sets that you are producing in the laboratory. And so for that particular session, I'm going to cover two things. The first thing is going to be what I'm calling the typical case, which is uh, about 90 to 95% of the samples that you type, right, the, the, the problem-less samples. And then the second item I'm going to cover is what's called the special case. Right? Um, and the special case is going to allow us to dive into even more detail yet and really look at some of the tools and features that are really only used that maybe 5 to 10% of the time. So that said, let's start out with an introduction to the software. So. One Lambda released our TypeStream Visual software back in uh, July of 2017 uh, with version 1.0. Um, and the main driver for releasing that version of software was our expanded support of not just the Ion Torn instrumentation for our all type NGS workflow, but obvious, uh, but additionally the, the Illumina MySeq instrumentation as well. And so to go along with that expanded support of instrument platforms, we had to design a new piece of software that could then handle the data output from both of those applications. So as this slide talks about, um, this software, the TypeStream Visual NGS Analysis software, has the ability to input and analyze single read sequencing data from the Ion Torn instrumentation or platform, as well as paired end sequencing data from the Illumina platforms as well. So this software is a standalone software. Um, so very similar to a lot of other software applications that you're already using in the laboratory. There is no network access required. Uh, the algorithm that we've designed for this particular software allows us to exceed concordant rates of 99.7%. And then the last bullet here, um, uh, version 1.2 of TypeStream Visual Software, which we expect to release next week, Monday, July 16th, allows for an additional expanded support or feature that we're referring to as auto analysis. And I will touch on that at the end of this initial portion of my presentation. And then finally, one other thing to note with version 1.2, uh, the regulatory status, so this particular version is both uh, for research use only uh, applications as well as um, in vitro diagnostic use in the European Union. So this is a CE marked uh, version as well. So let's step forward and talk a little bit about the architecture and the design behind this software. So many of you in your lab right now may be using HLA Fusion for uh, other uh, one Lambda products or applications. Okay. So the screenshot that I'm showing here is a screenshot of the homepage uh, from HLA Fusion 4.2 IBD. And the purpose of showing you this screenshot from HLA Fusion is that if I now overlay 
a screenshot of the home screen from TypeStream Visual, you'll notice that the look and the feel, at least of the home screen, is very, very similar. Okay, so the point here that we're trying to drive home is that TypeStream Visual, from an architecture and a design standpoint, is really based largely on the HLA Fusion architecture, a piece of software that's been in the field for many, many years now. Okay. Additionally, again, just to illustrate this point a little bit further, here's a screenshot, again, from HLA Fusion 4.2 IVD. This is a screenshot of the session summary screen, a screen that allows users to take a look at a high level or a bird's eye view of a run as a whole. And then if I, again, overlay a screenshot of TypeStream Visual, here's our session summary screen from TypeStream Visual 2. So not only does the software look the same on, for example, just the home screen, but a lot of the other interfaces that exist in HLA Fusion, the home screen, session summary, and if I fast forward one more time, here's a sample detail screen for both Fusion and now TypeStream Visual. We've allowed that, that interface, that design, to flow through into TypeStream Visual as well. So again, for laboratories using, using HLA Fusion currently, um, TypeStream Visual has a very, very uh, similar look and feel, and it's very, very easy to implement for that reason. Okay. So if we focus now just strictly on TypeStream Visual, which is, is, is the goal or the point of today's presentation, the various interfaces that a user is going to have access to or available to them are as follows. So first, the user is going to have access to a home screen and a session creation screen. And it's really these two screens that are used by the user to uh, initiate the processing of a run or a set of data. Okay. From there, we have a session summary screen. Again, a session summary screen is going to provide a high-level overview or a bird's eye view of a run as a whole. And then where, where applicable, users have the ability to jump into what's called a sample detail screen. So if the user wants to take a look at a sample or a test from a sample in greater detail, there's a sample detail screen that allows the user to do that. And for the special cases, we have another interface that we refer to as the reads view. And the reads view offers the user uh, many additional features that are really only used in very special circumstances um, to really maybe look at the more problematic samples or just samples in general that you might want to look at in a little bit more detail. And then lastly, reporting. Right? Like with any software application, whether it's HLA Fusion or otherwise, there's reporting modules and abilities built into the software as well. So it's all of these interfaces right, that the user has access to within the TypeStream Visual software to analyze any given data set or sample from a data set. Now, just because we have all of these interfaces available to the user, that does not mean that you're going to be using all of these in every single case, every single sample, every single test. Okay. Let's take each of these interfaces now and look at them in a little bit more detail. Okay. So let's first start with the home screen. So a couple of items that I want to highlight here with the home screen, okay, the first being um, functionality that allows the user to import and manage reference files. Okay, so reference files might be, for example, uh, lot-specific catalog files that are applicable to our all-type NGS assay kits, okay. or HLA library files. So those are your nomenclature files um, that allow you to analyze your data sets to a, spe a specific version of HLA nomenclature. Additional reference files that are, that are not highlighted on the screen might be uh, P group, G group, or NMDP code reference files, okay? So it's from this screen that allows users to manage and import all of these files. An additional item I want to uh, highlight from this particular screen is what we refer to as a job manager. And if I fast forward here, one additional click, just to expand this region of the screen, you can see what I'm talking about here. So the job manager is what enables the user to manage the jobs or the sessions that have been created and are either in process of being analyzed by the software or that are in the queue to be analyzed. Okay. So the job manager allows the user or gives the user full control to which session is currently processing. Do I want to process that given session? Do I maybe want to pause that given session, right, and maybe restart it at a later point? Okay. So the user has full control, full flexibility over the processing of as many sessions as they create. If we jump forward to actually then the session creation screen, the screen that a user is going to use to create your session. Okay. One of the features or one of the things that a user has to do with this particular screen is when creating a session, assign things such as a session name. 
They also need to assign the catalog. Okay, so again, these are lot specific catalogs that are applicable to the all type NGS assay kits. Third item that's highlighted here is the IMGT version or the library file, the HLA nomenclature version that the user is interested in using for that analysis. And then the fourth item here is an item which we refer to as analysis parameters. Okay. So if I just zoom in on some of this information, these analysis parameters are parameters that are, are, are fully configurable or modifiable to the user in the laboratory based on preference. So for example, if you look at the screenshot in the center of your screen, the user has the ability for any given session to dictate which loci are analyzed against. There's also additional parameters that you can see listed or fields that you can see listed below the various loci. So for example, there are various parameters here that uh, define um, stringency requirements for all of the various data or reads that are incorporated into your analysis. There's, for example, another parameter here, minimum base read depth. Users have the ability to define how many reads they require at a minimum at any given position for their analysis. So the nice thing about these analysis parameters is the user is able to configure and create as many of these configurations or parameter settings that they want. So this fourth item then, when a user is creating a session, is to select the particular configuration of analysis parameters that they want to analyze to. Once the user has created a session and that session is processed, the next step in the workflow is to jump to what's called the session summary screen. So again, the session summary screen gives the user a bird's eye view of the run as a whole. Okay. And some of the information that the user can get from the session summary screen is, like I already alluded to, high-level information such as HLA typing results. So what I've boxed out in red on this particular slide is all of the information that corresponds to one of the samples in this particular run or this particular session. The user also has the ability from the session summary screen to work with various sorting and filtering capabilities. Okay. So if I zoom in a little bit further on some of what I boxed out in red here, the user, for example, has the ability from this screen to filter by locus. So the utility here is, let's say, for example, we have a user uh, conducting 48 samples per run. Right? When I'm looking at a session summary screen and there's 48 samples in that screen, if there's only a particular locus or set of loci that I want to take a look at, I can filter out everything I'm not concerned with and keep what it is I am concerned with using this filter. The user also has the ability to filter uh, based on various what we call health metrics or warning flags. Um, and I'll discuss a little bit uh, later in this presentation some of these specific health metrics and warning flags that you see on your screen. And then third, again as an example, Here's a filter that allows users to filter based on the number of health metrics that were flagged for a particular sample or a particular test. Sample detail screen, so diving a little bit deeper. If we want to take a look at a sample or a test in greater detail, the user can jump to the sample detail screen. There's a lot of functionality involved or available in this screen, one of those items being a close match list, right? So we see this with a lot of other molecular typing methods, not just NGS. We see this with Sanger sequencing, other molecular typing methods as well. Functionality that allows us to compare the software assigned result to the next set of closest matches. And so that's what we see here as an example. Another main piece of functionality in the screen is the ability for the user to make final assignments, whether that's genotypic assignments, code-based assignments, either G group, P group, NMDP codes, or serologic assignments. And for your special cases, we have the read view. Okay. So the read view, for example, allows the user or gives the user the ability to navigate and jump around the gene, whatever gene or locus it is we're looking at. Okay. So that's the region here that I've zoomed in on. This is a region of the read view that allows the user to navigate to any position or any point, any region within the gene. The read view also gives the user the ability to view mapping statistics. So for example, like the screenshot I have on this screen, and we'll see this in more detail a little bit later, here's an example where the software's identified a mismatch at a particular position for this locus. This read view allows the user to select these positions of interest and then look at mapping statistics okay, that are applicable to the position or positions of interest. And then finally, reporting. Okay. So a couple of items here with reporting. So from the session summary screen, 
the user has the ability um, to conduct reporting on a full run basis. Okay. So there's various report options, uh, or formats rather, XML, PDF, CSV formats that the user can choose from the session summary screen. But then we also have a reporting module, and this is actually, again, for users that are familiar with HLA Fusion, this is similar functionality that exists in HLA Fusion, where we have a reporting module that allows the user or provides the user much greater flexibility when it comes to reporting. And so here, just to finish off the discussion on reporting, uh, just a quick snapshot of the types of reports currently available within TypeStream Visual. There are uh, flexible PDF reporting options, CSV, and XML reporting options as well. So again, the purpose of that, that initial discussion was really just to provide everyone with a really high-level overview of the various uh, interfaces or design of the software. What we just took a look at, we're going to jump uh, into greater detail in the second part of my presentation. But before we get to that second part, there's one additional thing I want to highlight here in this first part, and it's this item here that I just highlighted in yellow. So this is a slide that we already looked at at the beginning of this, this discussion, this webinar, um, just talking a little bit about TypeStream Visual software in general. And what I've boxed out here in red and yellow, um, the bullet reads auto analysis support for ion torn alumina workflows. So this is actually a new feature um, that is going to be available to all users of TypeStream Visual in version 1.2, which we expect to release next week, Monday, on July 16th. So I want to spend a little bit of time talking a little bit more about what this auto analysis support or feature actually is. So first, here's a screenshot from the TypeStream Visual home screen just showing how a user can access this auto analysis functionality or feature. Okay. So what is auto analysis? So this auto analysis functionality or feature that we built into TypeStream Visual 1.2 allows the user, regardless of whether or not they're using the Ion Torrent S5 or Illumina MySeq platform, to allow TypeStream Visual to auto-detect completion of a sequencing run and then initiate auto-creation of a session and processing of that session for you. So the benefit, if you just think of a hypothetical example or scenario here, is let's say you have an ion torrent or an aluminum IC sequencing run in process, and that run is set to complete in the middle of the night. Instead of the user having to wait until the following day, following morning, to initiate data transfer to TypeStream Visual, initiate creation of a session, and initiate processing of that session, this auto analysis functionality is going to do that for the user. So if you have a run that finishes in the middle of the night, TypeStream Visual is going to detect completion of that run, and it's going to initiate processing of that data for you as the user. And the idea then is so that when you come in that next day, the morning, um, or whenever it is, that run will be, that data will be processed and will be available to you as the user to start analyzing. So a couple of screenshots that I just want to show you here. When the user opens up this feature within the software to, to program or customize uh, the use of this feature, uh, the user is given, uh, as boxed out in red there, three different tabs to click through. Okay, So there's a tab for uh, users of the INS5. There's a tab specific for users of the Illumina MySeq. And then there is a tab which we are uh, calling the monitoring tab. Okay, So first, for users of the Ion Torn S5. Okay. All of the fields here that I've boxed out in red, these are fields that just need to be filled in initially one single time to configure TypeStream Visual to be able to detect completion of an Ion Torn S5 run and then make use of this auto analysis functionality. Okay. So when a user installs TypeStream Visual 1.2, if there's an interest in using this functionality, they fill out this information once and they're ready to go. They never have to fill this out again. Likewise, there's a similar tab for the Illumina MySeq. Um, the MySeq platform, the server structure within the MySeq is different from the Ion Torn S5, and for that reason, uh, we do not require as much information to be input to initiate this, this configuration or this interface. And then lastly, the monitoring tab. Okay. So the monitoring tab, once the user's configured the interface of TypeStream Visual with either their Ion Torn S5 or their Illumina MySeq, the monitoring tab is what the user is going to use to initiate monitoring of the interface now between TypeStream Visual and their instrument platform of choice. Okay. 
So the user here can select what are the analysis parameters or the configuration that they want to use for all auto analyses. What is the catalog file? What is the IMGT version? Okay. So again, the user only needs to change any of these three settings when applicable, right? So catalog file, for example, uh, if you receive a new lot of all type kits in the lab, that would be your catalyst to change the catalog, okay? This is not something that you need to change every single time. And then the final step of this process is this start monitoring button. When the user clicks this button, this starts what is called the monitoring service, okay? And so this is a service that will then run in the background and this service is constantly pinging every 10 seconds, either the Ion Torn S5 in your laboratory or the MyTeq instrument looking for completed runs. Okay. And when it pings and it sees a completed run, that is what then initiates data transfer into TypeStream Visual and auto analysis of that run. Okay. So again, this is a, this is a new feature uh, that we're excited to release to the community that we're excited to release as a part of TypeStream Visual 1.2, uh, which again should be available um, next week, Monday, July 16th. Okay. So let's move on then to part two of this webinar. So part two of this webinar, again, the goal here is to uh, give everyone on the call uh, a look or an idea at how we take the data that we've imported into TypeStream Visual after we've processed that data how do we now use this software, the interfaces available to us, the features available to us to analyze that data set? So as we discussed in the initial portion of this presentation or this webinar, the user has available to you all of these various interfaces, right? Home screen, session summary, sample detail, reads view. But again, when a user is analyzing any given sample or test within that sample, you're not necessarily going to use all of these interfaces or these screens in every single case. So what I want to cover during the second part of the webinar is what I'm calling, again, the typical case. Okay? And again, the typical case to me, these, these are, you know, the 90 to 95 percent of the samples that you're going to run, right, that, that have almost zero problems, right? And the goal really with these samples is to assess just that, the fact that no problems appear to exist, right? And the end goal with these samples is to really make final assignments and report out those final assignments. So I'm going to walk you through the process of how you handle this typical case. And then the second item here is what I'm calling the special case. Okay. So for the purpose of today's webinar and just based on time limitations, I'll show you a couple of examples, a couple of scenarios, and those scenarios are, one, how do you handle rare allele assignments within TypeShare and Visual? And then the second item is how do we handle HLA typing mismatches, right? So let's jump into the typical case. So a typical workflow to analyze or handle this, quote, typical case looks as follows, okay? So the user is always going to start from the home screen, okay? And remember the home screen is really used primarily for reference file maintenance as well as to monitor the progress of sessions that occur in processing. Second, right, session creation, right? So we start with a set of raw data, and we need to create a session to take a look at the data to begin with. Okay. So the session creation, again, this process involves importing of that data, initiation of processing, right? And when that processing is complete, the user is then going to jump to this third step. They're going to jump to the session summary. And again, the session summary is going to provide a bird's eye view or a high level view of uh, typing information, um, how do the various metrics look for the, the samples or the tests within that run. If from the session summary screen the user deems or determines that everything looks good for a particular sample and a set of tests within that sample, the user will jump to the sample detail screen, providing the user the ability to, for example, assess the software assigned typing against the next set of closest matches. And finally, if the user is happy still with everything that we they see, the final step within this process for the, quote, typical case is to make final assignments. Okay. So let's jump into now each of these five steps in a little bit greater detail and show you or walk you through how you would do this within the software. Okay. So again, 
first step is home screen, okay? And the home screen, again, before you can initiate creation of any session or processing of a session is to make sure that you have all of the catalog files available to you, all of the reference files available to you that you need to process that session, okay? So we got a little sneak peek at this earlier in the presentation, uh, but again, it's this home screen that allows us to uh, bring in the relevant catalog files, library files, code files, P code, G code, and MVP code files that we need to process a session. For those of you that use HLA Fusion in the laboratory, you may already be familiar with this feature known as Auto Update. So this Auto Update feature in HLA Fusion, as well as TypeStream Visual, is a feature that allows the user to um, very simply import or update all of these reference files, okay? So this eliminates the need for the user to, for example, go to the One Lambda website to manually pull a catalog file they need, manually pull the library file they need. Use of this auto update feature allows the software to check the web for you and import the catalog files that you need. Once the user is satisfied with the reference files that are loaded into the software, they can create the session. And so to get to the session creation screen, they can do so one of two ways as showcased on this slide, and that brings them to the screen that we saw earlier in the presentation. Okay. Again, there's four pieces of information that the user has to fill out um, when they're creating a session. Okay. First, they're going to name the session. Okay. The session can be named whatever you want. By default, the session is going to uh, default to a time and date stamp name, but again, this is modifiable or fully editable by the user. The second step is the user is going to select the lot specific catalog file corresponding to the all type NGS assay kit. Third step, the user is going to select the catalog file, or sorry, the library file of interest, so the HLA nomenclature version of interest. And then the fourth step, the user is going to select the particular configuration of analysis parameters that are of interest for that particular session. Once those four settings are made, the user is going to import either the FASTQ or the BAM files, regardless of uh, whether they're using the ion torn instrumentation or the aluminum iSeq instrument. And once those files are imported, the software is going to display one row of information per pertaining to each sample. Okay. So in this particular example, this particular screenshot, we can see an example where users created a session of just two samples okay, um, before they initiate processing. And once ready, the user is going to click the submit button. The software is going to jump them back to the home screen. And that session that they've created is now going to show up in the job manager on the home screen to showcase to the user the status of that particular session um, from a processing standpoint. Now, when this session is finished processing, the user is ready to take a look at the data. Okay? Now, one, one thing I want to bring up here, which, which I think is important to note, um, Let's say, for example, you have a run or a session of 48 samples. The user does not have to wait until all 48 samples have finished processing to take a look at that session. Okay. In order to visualize or take a look at a session and all the information that comes along with a session, all you need is for a single sample or a set of samples to have finished processing. Okay. So as soon as the first sample in a session has finished processing, the user has access to that sample and to that session. So long story short, you have access to this session in real time as each sample is finishing processing. Okay? You do not have to wait till a session is completed. So when we're ready to take a look at a session, we're going to jump over to our navigator. Again, this is a feature, this is a tool that is not exclusive to TypeStream Visual. Users of HLA Fusion should be familiar with the navigator. In the navigator, you're going to select the session of interest, and once you select that session of interest, the software is going to jump us to the session summary screen. Okay? And it's now really this screen that, again, is going to give us a first glimpse at what this run really looks like okay, from a quality standpoint. When you first open the session summary screen, the samples within that session are going to appear in this, what I'm calling, collapsed view. Okay? You can take these collapsed samples and expand them to see something like we see in this next slide. So once expanded, we have access to a lot more information now for this particular run. So this first set of information that I boxed out in red is what I'd like to discuss first. Okay. So if we zoom in on that set of information, the first thing we can highlight here is these circles that appear to the left of each test within the sample. And you'll notice that in this particular case, all are shaded green. Okay. The color associated with each of these circles gives the user, uh, it's a status indicator 
uh, of the health of that particular test. Okay. If you look off to the right-hand side of this slide, there's a couple of screenshots. The first screenshot on the top right is showcasing the different colored circles that could appear. Okay. So anything from green all the way down to red. Okay. And the color circle that could appear depends on the number of what we call health metrics that have been flagged for that particular test. So a circle shaded in green means that that particular test has passed all of the health metrics. If it's that teal or that blue color, that means that that particular test has been flagged for one of the health metrics. Okay. So the next question might be, what are these health metrics? Okay. So the four health metrics then that we rate every sample against are showcased in the bottom right corner of the slide. So key exon coverage, mismatch in exon uniformity, and allele balance. So I'm going to talk quickly about these, these metrics. So key exon coverage. So key exons we are defining for class one as exon two and three, for class two, exon two. For key exons, we expect that every, every single position in that key exon is covered by sequence. If even one position within those key exons is not covered by sequence, that particular test will be flagged. Okay. Mismatch in an exon. If in any exon, for whatever gene or locus we're taking a look at, there is a mismatch, that sample will be flagged for the user to take a closer look at that test. Uniformity. Uniformity, we're taking a look at the relative coverage across the gene. So we're taking a look at every single position, and we're assessing the position of, or sorry, we're assessing the coverage of each position relative to the next. So with this particular metric, we're essentially looking at variation of coverage across the gene, and so we do a variance calculation uh, for this particular metric. Okay. If the software detects too much variation in the coverage, the test will get flagged. And then finally, allele balance. So allele balance is not something that is um, you know, a new concept or idea for NGS. We have this same type of concept for those of you that are doing maybe Sanger sequencing in your laboratory as well, right? So with allele balance, we're looking at the balance in a heterozygous sample of both alleles, right? So in a perfect world, we would expect or, or want um, each allele to be represented at 50%, right, the total makeup of that particular test. So with allele balance, we've set a, th a threshold of, of 0.3 or 30% in the software. So if allele balance for the minority allele dips below 30%, we simply flag the sample as something that the user might want to take a closer look at. Okay. In the session summary, we're also going to showcase to the user for a particular typing assignment whether or not that allele or set of alleles um, is common and or well documented or rare. So in this particular example, if you look at the allele 2 assignment for the A-locus test, the A68 assignment, you'll notice in the zoomed-in view off to the right that there's a R in parentheses to the right of that allele. Anytime the user sees that R in parentheses, that signifies to the user that that particular allele is rare. If the R is not present, that indicates that that particular is common and or well-documented. We also provide the user with what's called a mismatch counter. So there are three fields to this mismatch counter. Okay. The first field, so if you look off to the right, the first field, which I've designated as K, signifies to the user the number of key exon mismatches for that typing or allele assignment. The second field, which I've designated as N, is the number of mismatches in non-key exons, and then the third field designated as I is the number of mismatches in intronic regions. So if the user sees 0, 0, 0, that indicates, as an example, that the allele assignment for that particular test is a perfect match to your sequence or to your data. Okay. If, however, for an example, you see 001 for a particular allele assignment, that would tell the user that the allele that is assigned, that is the closest match with one intronic mismatch. Okay. So if we zoom in a little bit closer on this particular DR beta 1 example, we can see that here, right? So the DR-beta-1044 assignment has one intronic mismatch, whereas the DR-beta-111-0401 assignment is a perfect match to your data or to your sequence. Okay. Some additional information that's boxed out in red that the user has available to them, total number of mapped reads for that particular locus, that particular gene. Further, what is the minimum coverage and the maximum coverage right, for that particular test? 
We also provide the user with various system comments that are based on warning flags that are built into the software. Okay, so warning flags, like as seen at the, at the bottom of the screen, as an example, I'll just highlight a few of these, possible null. So anytime the software assigns a null allele, uh, an allele assignment, the software is going to be flagged for the user to take a closer look at that particular assignment. Linkage, another warning flag. The software has built into it um, expectations for DR beta 1, DR beta 3, 4, 5, and DQ beta 1 linkage assignments. Okay. If the software notices an assignment for the D4 example, the DR beta 1 and the DR beta 3, 4, 5, uh, 5 assignment is out of linkage, the software will flag that sample to the user for them to take a closer look at. Okay. So as an example for the particular test that I've highlighted here, the user can click in the system comments field to figure out and see very clearly which warning flags were flagged for that particular test. And then finally, the user also has available to them a coverage histogram. So this particular histogram shows the user the relative read depth or coverage of allele 1 versus allele 2 across the gene. So the, the colors that are seen here in green, that is the relative coverage or depth of allele 1 across the entire gene, and then blue corresponds to allele 2. So the user can look at all of that information that we just showcased or highlighted here to make an initial assessment or have a really good idea of whether or not there are any samples or tests within a sample within this session that the user needs to take a closer look at. Okay. So since we're talking about here the, quote, typical case, let's say that for this particular example, we took a look at this first sample. Right? We looked at all of the information that we just discussed, and we're happy with everything we see. Um, we don't see any possible novel alleles. We don't see any rare assignments that perhaps we're concerned with. Okay, and those are just a few examples. If the user's happy with what they see, the next thing they're going to do is they're going to double click on any of the tests within that sample or just the sample as a whole. And that's going to navigate the customer to the sample detail screen. Okay. Now, one of the optional things that a user might do in the quote typical case in the sample detail screen is take a, cl uh, a look at the close match list for any of the loci uh, in this particular sample, okay? So once you're in the sample detail screen, the user can navigate between any of the loci using the, 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 the top left quadrant of the screen. Once they select the locus of interest, if they want to take a closer look at the close match list, they would click on the tab highlighted here, and the close match list would display for both allele 1 and allele 2. If I forward one more time in my presentation here, I've zoomed in on this close match in a little bit more detail so you can see this better, okay? So the close match list, again, like a lot of other molecular applications and software applications, is going to show the user the next set of closest matches when you compare that against the software assigned match. And so you can see here in this table, all of the information on the left corresponds to the close matches for allele 1. Information on the right, the close matches for allele 2. The position column that I've highlighted in red all of these positions that are indicated, they actually, these are actually hyperlinks. Okay? So if there's a particular close match that a user wants to take a look in greater detail, they can actually click on any of these positions, which again are hyperlinks, which will then navigate the user to whatever that position is in that reads view that we discussed a little bit earlier. Okay? But let's say for the sake of this analysis, the customer is happy, and at this point we're ready to make our final assignment. Now, in the final assignments interface, the user, again, is able to make a series of uh, assignments, genotypic assignments, code-based assignments, or serologic assignments. What I want to highlight here are a couple ways or scenarios of making genotypic assignments. Okay. So here, this first example of a genotypic assignment, in the top left, we're showcasing to the user the possible genotypes, in this case, is an unambiguous result. Okay the possible genotype that can be assigned or, or made as the final assignment. If the user double clicks that genotype, it's going to throw it down into the section of the screen that's showcased in the middle of the screen that you're viewing right now. Okay? And whatever you double click as a user and throw into that subsequent interface, that is what you as the user are now defining as the final assignment for that test. Okay? Additional functionality within this window allows the user to truncate the final assignment to either two, three, or four fields, whichever the user prefers. So if you look at the very bottom 
of that center screenshot. We can see currently that that final assignment is truncated to two fields, but if the user prefers three fields, you can see the three field assignment there or four fields here. Another example, here's an ambiguous ER beta four result. Okay, it's ambiguous at the fourth field. Now, if the user wants to report this out, one way that they can do this, as an example, they can double click both of those genotypes. Now, when it comes to truncating the result, because the DR beta three assignment is unambiguous, the user might choose to report out all four fields. But because we have a fourth field ambiguity with the DR beta four assignment, the user here might choose to report out just three fields. And the last example that I want to show you for making genotypic assignments is that of a homozygous result. Okay, so here we see a homozygous DP alpha assignment. Now, if the user reports this and they double click the result, there's two possible ways that the user can report out this homozygous result. So if you look at the screenshot on the left, so that's this screenshot here that's in the center of your screen, okay, the user has chosen to report out this homozygous result in both the allele 1 and the allele 2 fields. Okay. However, because this is a homozygous assignment, if the user chooses to just take this homozygous assignment and report this allele once, they can click on this clear final 2 button, and that will produce what is showcased on the far right here, where that DP alpha 1 allele is only going to be reported out once. And finally, once the user has made all of the final assignments of interest for this particular sample, built into the software two levels review uh, of review, so we have the save button, which is your first level of review, and then the confirm button off to the right, which is a second level of review. After the customer clicks on the save button as an example, the tests that have been saved will be shaded green in the top left quadrant of your screen. Okay, so just a visual indicator to you as a user which tests have been saved. So now that we've walked through that process of the typical case and we've made the final assignments, I just want to jump to TypeStream Visual and just walk you through this process in a little bit more detail just to give you an additional perspective of how do we make these final assignments. So I'm going to toggle my screen over to the TypeStream Visual software. I'm going to open up the session that we were just taking a look at. So in my session summary screen, I'm going to open up the sample that we were just looking up in the sample detail screen, and I'm going to show you how you can go about making these final assignments that I just walked you through via the slides. So this ALOCUS test that we're looking at initially here is the ALOCUS test that was present in the slides. So if we want to report out this genotype, this A24868 genotype, as the final assignment, the user can double-click that genotype, and the software will throw that genotype to the bottom of the screen in the final assignment field. Okay. Now again, remember that the user has the ability or option at this case to truncate the final assignment to either two, three, or four fields. Okay. So the way that my software application is set up, by default, the software is reporting this result out at two fields. However, if I want to change this to either three fields, like I've done there with a click of the radio button that says three, or four fields, I can do that. And again, you'll notice that I have full control of doing this on a per allele basis. So you'll notice I've changed the allele 1 assignment to four fields, but the allele 2 assignment still remains at two fields, giving me full flexibility to report out the allele 2 assignment as I prefer. Okay. Let's say I'm happy with that particular assignment. I can click Save. And you'll notice again that up in the top left quadrant, the A locus test is now shaded green, and the software jumps me to the next test. I'm going to jump to the DR beta 345 assignment because this was that, that fourth field ambiguous assignment that we just looked at in the slides. So again, here, right, in the case of an ambiguous assignment, if I'm happy with the software's suggested result of the ambiguous assignment, I'm going to double click both of those genotypes. Okay. Now, because the DR beta 3 assignment was unambiguous at fourth field, I'm going, to, I'm going to choose the fourth field radio button, and I'm going to report out the DR beta 3 assignment at four fields. However, because the DR beta 4 assignment was ambiguous at four fields, I'm going to truncate that to three fields. Okay, so again, here's an example where, again, we have full control or flexibility of how we report out each allele 
I'm reporting out allele one to four fields and allele two to three fields. And I'm going to save that test. And then the final example, which we took a look at in the slides, was this homozygous DP alpha one test. Okay. So again, to report this out, I'm going to double click that particular test. Let's say I want to report this out to four fields. You'll notice by default, this homozygous result is being reported out in both the allele one and allele two fields. If I'm happy with that as a laboratory, I can save this test at this point. However, if, as a lab, I prefer to see this assignment only reported out in either the allele one or allele two fields, I click that clear final two button, and the software displays that result as such, reporting that result in just one of the fields. Okay. And again, I can save that result at this point. All right, so all of those steps that we just talked through, okay, starting from the home screen, creating the session, assessing the session from the session summary screen, and reporting out final assignments, that is the series of steps that a user is going to take in 90 to 95% of the cases or samples that they analyze. That is, again, what we're calling the typical case. Okay, so very straightforward. What I want to finish up with then for the remainder of the time is what we're calling the special case. Okay, so again, the special case is, you know, these 5 to 10% of the cases where we're making use of additional functionality available to us within TypeStream Visual. Perhaps these are problematic cases or cases that just require maybe a little bit more attention than the typical case. Right. So the cases that I want to highlight to you today are these two scenarios. One, rare allele assignments, and then two, um, scenarios where we have HLA typing mismatches. In other words, scenarios where we possibly have novel alleles uh, present in, in our sample. So let's first take a look at rare allele assignments. So for the sake of, of walking everyone through this example, I'm jumping straight to the session summary screen to illustrate this point. And what I want to take a look at for this particular case is this DQ beta 1 test. And I've zoomed in on the typing assignment for this DQ beta 1 test. You'll notice, actually, that both alleles for this DQ beta 1 assignment have the R in parentheses to the right of the allele assignment, indicating that both of these alleles are rare. However, if you look at the DQ beta 10502 assignment, the rare assignment or de designation for this particular example is due to the fourth field um, nomenclature of this particular allele. So maybe I'm not as concerned about that. However, if you take a look at the second DQ beta 105 allele, the 0567 assignment, also designated as rare, this is something that maybe is more of a red flag to me, right? Maybe something that I want to take a look at in a little bit closer detail. Maybe I want to walk through a series of steps to determine, is this DQ beta 1 0567 actually present in my sample, or is it maybe something more common? Okay. So I'm going to show you a couple of ways that you can use additional functionality within TypeStream Visual to assess this type of scenario. Okay. So the first way that you can assess this scenario is to jump to the sample detail screen. Okay, so we've already had a look at this screen on a few occasions today. And so from when, within the sample detail screen, I can make use of this close match list to take a look at, for this second allele, what are some of the more common close matches for the software assigned to DQ Beta 10567. And so here, if we zoom in further, okay, on the close match list for allele 2, we can see that the closest match for the 0567 assignment is the more common DQ beta 105, 03, 101. Okay. So what a user might choose to do at this point is assess this close match a little bit closer to determine whether or not the more common 0503 is present as opposed to the rare 0567. So what the user can do now from this close match list is in that position column I mentioned earlier that all of these positions are hyperlinks. So if the user wanted to, they could click on this position, this E2293, which stands for Exon 2, position 293. If they click on that particular position, the software now is going to jump us to the reads view. Okay, so now this is the first time that we're taking a look at the reads view in a little bit more detail to make use of some of its functionality in this case of rare allele assignments. Now, when the software opens the reads view, it is automatically going to jump you to that position you selected in the close match list. 
So that position in this case is this position that I've highlighted or boxed out vertically in red. Okay. So the goal or what we are going to do here as the user at this point is now that we're at this position that differentiates the DQ beta 10567 from the DQ beta 10503-0101, is take a look at what base do we expect to be present if the more common 0503-0101 was in fact present in our sample. So to do that or to make that assessment, I'm going to add some additional information to the screen. So two screenshots. So the top screenshot here is just referencing back to that close match list okay, that we looked at where the software indicated the 0503-0101 is the closest match to the 0567. Okay. So what additional information the software is providing us here was not only is it exon 2 position 293, that's the position that differs between these alleles, but if the 0503 was present, we would expect an A at this position. However, the software is reporting a G in the consensus. So the second screenshot directly below now, this is a zoomed in view of the read mapping statistics within the reads view for this particular position. So what the user can do now using these remapping statistics is take a look at the remapping statistics for the DQ beta 10567 assignment and look at how many reads were mapped to this particular allele at this position and what was the percent base assignment for those reads at that position. So we can see here in this particular case 360 reads or 97.5% of the reads mapping to this position, this allele, contained a G. Only eight reads, or 2.17%, had the A. Okay. And remember, if the more common 0503 was present in our sample, we would, have had, we would have required the A. So just by looking at this one position alone in the read view using this additional functionality, this functionality right here has allowed us to see or to prove that the more common 0503 is in fact not present and that the rare DQ beta 10567 that the software has reported to us is in fact present in this particular sample. Now, alternatively, an alternative approach to what we just did is to, again, from the reads view, so if we wanted to jump straight from session summary to the reads view, we could do a similar type of thing. Okay. So within the reads view, there's another tool that we call the allele comparator tool. Okay. This allele comparator tool allows the user to pull in the reference or expected sequence for any allele of interest. Okay. So in this case, what we're doing in this screenshot or this example, again, we want to pull into the software for the sake of comparison the more common allele when comparing against the Raro 567. So the user here has full flexibility or control in this allele comparator tool to type in and select whatever allele or set of alleles they want to compare against the software assigned allele. So here in the screenshot, we've typed in the 0503 And after we type that in, what the software does is it adds what we call a track to the top of this reads view. And this track is going to showcase to the user all positions within the sequence that differ between the software assigned assignment or reference compared to the set of alleles that we pulled in ourselves. So what the user can do is they can click or select this track and then navigate to the positions that differ using the left and right arrow keys on the keyboard. So we can see here in the screenshot, it's this position highlighted in green that is the position that differs. And again, compare using the read mapping statistics, the expected base for the 0567, which was the G, compared against the expected base for the more common 0503, which was the A. And again, this is just another approach that a user can use to prove the presence or absence of a rare assignment as reported by the software. So real, uh, real quickly, again, I just want to provide some additional perspective. I'm going to jump back to the TypeStream Visual software again. I'm going to jump back um, to the home screen. I'm going to open up a session here that I have designated as rare assignment. And here we go. If you look at the DQ beta 1 test, here's the DQ beta 1 test that we were just talking about, right, with the DQ beta 10567 assignment. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the second approach to make the assessment we just did via those PowerPoint slides. So to jump to the read view, I'm going to click on this number one genotype indicating one genotypic assignment for this test. And the software is going to automatically open up the read view for me. Okay. 
And now again, what I have the ability to do as the user is use this allele comparator function. Okay, so here's the software assigned DQ Beta 10567 reference or allele. If I want to compare that against the more common 0503, I can type that allele into this field. And you'll notice as I type, it's dynamic, right? This dropdown is updating with the various alleles as I type out the allele of interest. So here's the DQ Beta 10503 or 101 that I'm interested in. I can select that, and up top, the software has added this additional track. If I select this track by clicking on it, okay, it shades it green, and I can now use the right arrow key on my keyboard, allowing me to jump to the position. It's this position here, highlighted in green, that differs between the 0567 and the 0503 And now, again, what I'm going to do as the user is I'm simply going to look over at these remapping statistics that correspond to this particular allele assignment, and I'm going to look at for the reads that map to this allele at this position, what base was contained in those reads? And does that base correspond to the 0567, or does it correspond to the more common 0503? And again, it's very clear in this case, uh, 360 reads, or 97.5% of the reads, have the G, which corresponds to the 0567. So again, this is one of two approaches that can be used to gain confidence uh, in a rare allele assignment. And then to finish off our time today, the last special case that I want to highlight is the case of HLA typing mismatches. So let's take this example. Okay, so let's take this A-locus test. And I've zoomed in on this A-locus test, and you can see that on this slide. Now, there's a couple things I want you to notice in this zoomed-in screenshot. The first item is the colored circle that displays to the left of this particular test. Instead of green, in this case, it's teal or this blue color. And if we remember, this teal or blue color signifies to the user that this particular test was flagged for one of the health metrics. And you'll notice, if you take your cursor within the software and you hover over that circle, you'll get this little tooltip that pops up. And in this case, the tooltip states to the user, there was a mismatch in an exon, identifying to the user that it was the mismatch in exon health metric that is flagged for this particular sample. Okay, so here's your first flag as a user that this might be a test you want to take a closer look at. Additionally, look at the second allele, the A26 assignment. The software right off the bat has truncated this assignment to just A26. Additionally, if you look at the mismatch counter, we see 0, 1, 0 in the mismatch counter, signifying to the user that there are zero mismatches in the key exons, one mismatch, somewhere in another exon, and then zero mismatches in any of the introns. Additionally, the software has flagged that this is a possible new or novel allele. Okay? So these I'm highlighting to you as possible, uh, or sorry, rather, these are flags that the software is displaying to the user to highlight to the user very clearly that this is a test that you might want to take a look a little bit closer, that this may not be the, quote, typical case. Okay? So what I'm going to do as a user in a case like this is I'm going to jump straight to the reads view. And within the reads view, there are tracks that correspond to mismatch positions. So in the previous example of rare allele assignments, we looked at a track that allows the user to take a look at differences between the software assigned assignment and a user inputted reference sequence. Here we have a track for mismatch positions. So similarly, if the user selects the mismatch track and they use their left and right arrow keys on the keyboard, the software is going to jump the user to the mismatch positions. And in this case, here is the mismatch position shaded in red. Now, what the user is going to do here okay, is they're going to take a look, and I've zoomed in on this so that it's easier to look at. Look at the top right-hand corner of your screen. I've zoomed in on this red mismatch position in closer uh, detail. Look at the A26 assignment. Okay. The software is using the A26 01101 as the reference for this particular um, test. The A260101, we expect to have a C. Okay. However, the software, based on all the reads that have mapped to this position and to this allele, noticed that the overwhelming number of reads actually had a T. And so the software in the consensus has assigned the T. Likewise, if you look down in the zoomed-in view of the remapping statistics, we can confirm that, right? 
we can look at for the reads that map to this position in this allele, there were 244 reads or 95.7% of the reads mapping to this position allele that had the T. There were only 3.5% or nine of the reads that had a C. So these read mapping statistics now help to confirm that yes, this is a substitution, right, at this particular position. Further, in the read mapping statistics portion of the screen, the software is also, oops, sorry, the software is also showing to the user for the particular codon that that particular position sits in, what was the amino acid that was encoded for before taking into account the substitution. So that's what's signified here by ref or reference to allele two. And then after or taking into account the substitution. So here, con or consensus two for allele two. And here in this case, you'll notice that as a result of this particular substitution at this position, this is actually a silent substitution, right? The software showing us in the remapping statistics that the same amino acid is encoded for after the substitution is taken into account. So from this reads view, we've confirmed that this substitution exists, one. And two, we've also been able to confirm that this particular substitution is a silent substitution. Okay, so now what the user could do in this particular special case is jump to their sample detail screen, right? The user now has to make a final assignment based on what is a novel allele or a new allele. Okay. So there's a few ways the user can go about this. Okay. When it comes to making the genotypic assignment, for the AO2 assignment, they might report that out to four, four fields, right? But for the A26 assignment, we know, because this is a silent substitution, we know that this allele is a novel A2601 variant. For the A2601 assignment, the user then might choose to just simply report this out to two fields. Additionally, remember that we also have the ability to report out either G or P codes, right? A user might, in this case, also choose to report out one of those. This example here is showing, uh, showing the reporting of um, the AO201P group as well as the A2601P group. And then finally, as another example, in any of these cases for any test, the user also has the ability to create or add user-defined commentary. So here's an example of commentary that a user might add for a particular case like this, right? Silent substitution at position exon 3, actually, that's a typo, exon 5, position 924. Right, a change from ATC to ATT, and this is an A2601 new. And again, uh, this is just an example of text that you could put into this user-defined common field. Uh, again, the user has full flexibility over what is entered here. Another important thing to note about this comment field, anything that you add to this field, this is something that the user can report out in the end. Okay? So in addition to reporting out the genotypic assignments, code-based assignments, the user can also choose to report out any commentary that was added to a test as well. Okay. And finally, to finish things off, I'm going to jump back to TypeStream Visual, and I just want to highlight some of what we did with that particular mismatch case. So again, I'm going to jump back to my home screen. I'm going to select for my navigator this session, which I've labeled as mismatch. And you can see right at the top, here's that ALOCUS test that we just took a look at. I'm going to open up this test in the reads view, okay? and if you give this about five to 10 seconds, the reads view should open again for us, um, and the screen will look very, very similar to what we saw with the rare assignment case. When the reads view opens, the first thing that I'm gonna do is I'm going to select the mismatched track, okay? which is gonna allow us as the user to navigate to the mismatched position. Okay? So now with the reads view open, like I just stated, I'm gonna select that mismatched track. I click on it, it shades it in green. If I click the right arrow key on my keyboard, the software jumps me to this mismatch position in Exon 5, Exon 5 position 924. Again, what, this, what the user can do at this point is take a look at the read mapping statistics for this A26 assignment, right? Determine whether or not the read mapping statistics are in agreement with the software assigned consensus of a T at this particular position, noting a substitution. From looking at the remapping statistics, we confirmed the presence of the substitution, and then that second step was taking a look at, right up top here, what is the impact of that substitution, right? 
And in this case, again, we determined that the impact of the substitution was that this is a silent substitution, right? The amino acid that was encoded for here at this codon, codon 284, was unchanged. Okay? And again, from here, the software, sorry, rather the user, would be able to jump to the sample details screen and report out this assignment in any manner that I uh, showcased previously to you. So with that, that wraps up uh, my discussion. I hope that gives you a good overview of some of the features, again, to design the architecture of TypeStream Visual, but I think more importantly, again, showcasing how we can use some of those interfaces and some of those features to analyze the typical case, but all this, also the special case as well. So just to finish up, um, again, as Baron mentioned at the beginning of this call, the remainder of the time today we want to use to answer your questions, okay? So as a reminder, for anyone on the call, if you have questions, please enter questions into the Q&A section of the webinar interface. Okay. Uh, so that concludes the presentation portion of today's webinar. Uh, Keith, thank you for delivering such a great presentation today. We really appreciate it. Um, you stimulated quite a few questions from our audience already. Uh, so let's go ahead and move into the question and answer component of today's webinar. Uh, let's see if we've got about five questions. Uh, the first of the questions we have, Keith, is um, are there any special hardware requirements needed to implement the new auto analysis feature? Good question. Um, so the short answer to that question is no. So all of the existing hardware requirements or uh, performance specifications that go along with TypeStream Visual 1.0 or version 1.1 still apply to TypeStream Visual 1.2. So for a user to uh, make use of the auto analysis functionality that will be a part of TypeStream Visual 1.2, the user will not require any new hardware or improvements to existing hardware to be able to handle that, that, that additional functionality. Okay. Thank you for that. Let's see. Uh, the next question we have is, uh, can the software be connected to HistoTrack or other LIMS uh, systems? Sure. Um, so the foundation is there within TypeStream Visual. So all of the information, all of the database structure is there to be able to interface with something like HistoTrack or other LIMS systems. Um, One Lambda has not built that interface between TypeStream Visual um, and HistoTrack. However, for users that are interested, and again, since HistoTrack was specifically brought up in the question, uh, for users that are interested in that type of interface, um, working with SystemLink um, should enable that, that interface to be built. Um, I, I do believe, actually, as well, that we have at least one one of our users currently that has done exactly that. So it's very well possible that even though one Lambda has not built that interface, that that interface may exist through someone like SystemLink if HistoTrack is of interest. Okay, great, great response. Um, okay, next question here. Okay, so you're, you kind of addressed this question uh, a little bit just now, but maybe you can uh, elaborate a little bit. So can, can high-resolution typing results from TypeStream Visual be imported into HLA Fusion patient records, and how is this done? How is this accomplished? Yeah, yeah. Um, so since patient records was specifically brought up just to maybe uh, provide a little bit more context or perspective, uh, for those that are currently using HLA Fusion in the laboratory, um, HLA Fusion is set up um, uh, with a patient management uh, system. Um, and with that patient management si uh, system, there are these patient records, like was mentioned in the, in the question. And with, with a patient record, you can take a patient, and for that patient, you can, you can import um, the, the, the typing of that patient from whatever technique it is that you use and analyze that data in HLA Fusion with. So if a laboratory is using all type, um, for their NGS workflow in the lab and then TypeStream Visual to analyze that data, TypeStream Visual does have the ability to export typing information using an XML export file. Okay? And that XML export can then be used as an import into HLA Fusion research so that all of that typing information from TypeStream Visual can be uploaded into a set of patient records in HLA Fusion. So that information will be available through that database. Okay. Lots of questions coming in. 
Um, what is the recommended approach to high background positions? Sure. So that, um, that honestly, is a, it's, it's a loaded question. Um, uh, whenever the software identifies a high background position or positions to a user within a test uh, or set of tests, the first thing that a user really needs to glean or determine is what is the cause or the reason for that high background, right? Um, for example, is that high background due to sequencing error, right? Perhaps that high background position is sitting within a homopolymer region, or perhaps that high background position is sitting within a microsatellite or repeat region, right? If you see that type of thing, and this is something that laboratories learn over time, right, as they look at more and more data, you'll realize that that type of thing is a direct result, right, of sequencing through these more difficult regions. Or an alternative, right, could be contamination, right? High background as displayed within the reads view within TypeStream Visual could be a result of contamination as well. And again, it's, it's assessing where that high background position is located within the gene. Is it located within these problematic regions or these regions that are difficult to sequence through or not? And if not, is that high background maybe being caused, right, by something like background? It's a lot of those types of things that need to be assessed to really figure out what is the next step right, in determining how do I handle that particular background. In the vast majority of cases, um, the presence of background is usually caused by, again, I just, I call this sequence, inherent sequencing error, right? And it's just being, a, it, it, it's learning to and being able to recognize that type of thing and realize that that's inherent to an extent. Okay, uh, next question. I have a two-part question. There's actually two questions uh, very similar. What does the gray color represent in the coverage field? And two, sure. what is the asterisk in the mismatch field after the plus sign uh, in the allele, allele assignment? Sure. So, so for the, the, for the first the question, color. yep. Uh, so for the first, uh, first question, I've, I've jumped back again just to provide perspective and to help illustrate uh, this point. I've jumped back to, to TypeStream Visual. Uh, so the first question around what is the gray shading mean, right, for the coverage histogram? So that question relates to this region of the screen here. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to, I'm going to click on um, here this histogram for B locus. And you'll notice with this B locus histogram, in addition to the green and the blue shading like we talked about previously, right, corresponding to the depth or the coverage of allele 1 versus allele 2, the gray shading, when you see this type of thing, what that signifies is that the reads mapping across that particular region, wherever the gray shading uh, is located, those reads actually map to both alleles. In other words, that read or those reads are not spanning any heterozygous positions to be able to assign that read to either allele 1 or allele 2. So you see this type of thing a lot when you have combinations of alleles or heterozygous samples where those alleles are very, very similar to one another, right? There's not a lot of variance or differences within those two alleles to separate uh, from another. And then the second part of the question, let's see, yeah, here. So if you look at uh, the DQ Alpha 1 assignment, specifically the DQ Alpha 10505 assignment, you'll notice in the mismatch field we see 002, and then there's an asterisk. Uh, to the right of the number two. So what that asterisk signifies, and this asterisk can actually showcase or be present in any, any of these three fields. The asterisk would signify to the user that there is one or more uh, regions, whether it's an exon or an intron, in the sequence that is not defined in the IMGT database for that allele or alleles that are a part of that allele assignment. Okay. So we're getting a lot of questions come in. If we happen to run short on time today, um, we will be posting this webinar uh, within the next week onto our One Lambda website. If we don't get around to your question, please uh, reference that webinar recording. You will see my email address at baron.victor at thermofisher.com. I'd encourage you to email me any questions that you have that might be outstanding, and we'll certainly get back to you. Um, Keith, the next question that we have is, what is the linkage flag for? Will the software flag yep. unusual DQDR associations in the sample? Yep. That's it. So that's exactly what that, that flag is for. So uh, again, just jumping back to the software to illustrate this. So here uh, in the session summary, again, if we look at this uh, portion of the session summary that showcases to the user um, 
uh, their ability to filter or sort data in various ways. If you look kind of off towards the center, we can see all the various warning flags that are built into the software, and one of those warning flags is this linkage warning flag. Um, so uh, the person that asked this question is exactly correct. Um, the linkage warning flag will appear for, let's use your example, a case where the DR beta 1 assignment is out of linkage with the DR beta 3, 4, 5 assignment. So what the user would see in that case is in this system comments field, okay, specifically for the DR beta 1 or DR beta 3, 4, 5 assignment, if that warning flag was flagged for that test, that comment or that flag would appear in this comment field. Now, obviously, in this example, uh, I, don't have, I don't have a scenario or an example like that up on my screen right now, but this is where you would see it. Okay. Um, one additional point as well. Um, the linkage flag also applies to DQ beta 1 as well, okay? So what we're looking at here is linkage between DR beta 1, 3, 4, 5, and then DQ beta 1. Okay. It looks like we've got uh, about 15 more minutes. Um, I'm going to kind of combine uh, two different questions here. Uh, please be patient with me, Keith. There's, there's actually uh, three questions in this, but I'll try to simplify it here. Um, one of them uh, is, does the auto analysis feature need to be set up before every run? Uh, the second question has to do with the auto processing says, does the computer need to be in unlocked status in order for the auto processing uh, to happen on a MySeq? And what happens if the PC goes into sleep mode? Would it still process yep. the data? Yep. yep, all good questions. Like you said, all, all related questions. So. Um, first, just, just starting from the top, um, uh, the auto analysis feature does not need to be triggered manually by the user every time you want to use it. Um, as long as the user initiates or turns on the monitoring service okay, associated with that particular feature, that monitoring service is going to continue to run in the background. And, and, and again, what it's doing is it's whether you're using in your laboratory the ion torn S5 or the aluminum iSeq instrument, that service is pinging every 10 seconds, that instrument, to just determine whether or not there's a new run present that it had not seen before, okay? So short answer to that initial question, no. Uh, there's no manual trigger uh, that the user has to conduct any time they want to use that service. Um, second part of the question, uh, Baron, sorry, just remind me again. Yes. Sure, sure. It says, uh, does the computer need to be in an unlocked status in order to perform auto processing? What happens if the computer goes into sleep mode? Will it still process it. Okay. the data? Okay. Um, so the computer can be locked as long as the user is logged into Windows. Okay. So as, the, as long as the user is logged into Windows and the TSV application is up, um, that client, that workstation, can be either locked or unlocked. Okay. Um, now, if the computer goes into sleep mode, that would cut off the auto analysis service. Okay. So um, whatever client this auto analysis service is running on, that client needs to be um, logged into Windows. Again, it can either be locked or unlocked. That's not an issue. Okay. But it, and it cannot be in sleep mode. Typically what we find um, when we go into a lot of laboratories, or the best way at least to set up Pipestream Visual, is designate a client in the laboratory uh, or a workstation in the laboratory um, that possesses a good deal of computing resources, right? And have that or designate that as the client in the lab that is the client that is going to be used to process all of your data. This might also then be the client that is running this auto analysis function or feature. Further, what you can do then is you can set up this software in a client server setup. So if you've already designated that one client as a client that's going to process the data, run the auto analysis feature, it's always logged in. Perhaps it's locked. That's fine. You can have TSV, TypeStream Visual, then installed on various other clients in the laboratory. Okay. And all of those other clients then you can log into Windows, log out of Windows. Those clients can go to sleep as often as they want. And all you're using those clients for is really to act as a viewer. Right? So after the auto analysis functionality is finished processing a run or a set of runs, you can then use any of those other clients at any other point 
to act as a viewer to then open up any of those sessions to view that data. Okay, great. Uh, we've got, let's see, uh, can we designate the default number of fields in final assignments? So can you yes. put a defaulted uh, field assignment? Yeah. So um, in, uh, in my instance of software that I was uh, showing you uh, during this webinar, my software, and I think I mentioned this at one point, was set up to, by default, um, uh, make the final assignments at two fields. There is a global setting within TypeStream Visual that is uh, customizable um, to lab or user preference where you can select, by default, do you want those final assignments to report out at two, three, or four fields? Okay. Next question. Uh, how can we check QC or the quality of a test or a sample, and when should I discard the results? Yeah. So um, a lot of this information, again, is going to be assessed from your session summary screen. Uh, again, the session summary screen, it, it contains a lot of information around the quality or, as we call it, the health, right, of a given sample or a given test. And um, you're looking at how a lot of these metrics really kind of play together to determine whether or not that particular sample or a test within a sample is valid or not valid, right? Perhaps requires a repeat if it's not valid. Um, there's very few metrics or parameters that you're going to take a look on that session summary screen where if, for example, a single parameter metric is missed, you're not going to use that single parameter or metric to determine that that test or that sample uh, needs to be repeated. You're going to look at how all those various metrics, all those parameters play together to make that final assessment. Okay. Uh, this is our last question, I believe. Um, can TypeStream deal with problematic genes such as uh, HLA DRB1? Uh, it is known that DRB3 and 4 are co-amplified along with DRB genes, and certain DR beta 1 genes are amplified at a lower rate than others. Yeah, so, so basically yeah, so asking, can it deal with problematic genes? You know, how do you do that? Yeah, so this, the, the handling of that type of data really occurs on the front end of, of data processing. So part of the front end algorithm that we have built into the software um, allows the software to identify uh, reads, right, that are just completely unexpected, um, perhaps pseudogenes or, or, or other scenarios. And whenever the software sees those type of scenarios, and again, this is on the front end, that type of data is filtered out and it's not factored into the final output or the analysis of the sample, the data that we actually see as users when we're taking a look at TypeStream Visual. Okay. Uh, we've got one more question. Um, if we install TypeStream Visual onto a SQL server, um, is there a mechanism that would initiate auto-processing through the server? Got it. Um, I honestly, yeah, that's a very point, a good question. It's a very pointed question. I honestly do not know um, the answer to that question. I don't want to. I don't want to lead you down the wrong path. I guess what I would uh, advise in a case like this, right, where you have a uh, a very specific IT setup in the laboratory like that, um, would be to contact our technical support group. We have a really uh, great technical support group here at One Lambda. Um, part of that group focuses 100% of their time on software and IT-related issues. Uh, these are actually types of questions, these, these very pointed, specific questions. These are types of questions that that group gets very frequently. Uh, and honestly, they are, they're best versed to, to address those types of questions and then to be able to provide further guidance on how to handle those, those types of questions or scenarios, too. Okay, so thank you again, Keith, for, for delivering such a well-thought-out and detailed presentation today. And thank you to everyone in our